Welcome to our second webinar this year. Uh, this webinar is designed to talk a little bit about what's happened uh, in the first quarter of the year, beginning of the second quarter, as well as go over market developments that have happened uh, throughout the last four or five months. We've had a number of large events, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, an oil price and oil production shock, which have had a large impact on the markets and had a large impact on um, uh, our clients uh, and the industry. So we know at this point in time, everyone's extremely concerned, maybe a little bit rattled about what's happened in markets. There are concerns about whether um, this market downturn is going to accelerate, get worse, or if, it, if not, when it's gonna get better. So we hope to talk about a little, a little, a little bit on those things here at a fairly uh, high or mid-range level today. Um, so we appreciate that everyone's very uh, concerned. Uh, we're here for you. If you have any questions after the uh, webinar, feel free to contact your uh, counselor, wealth counselor, or call me directly. Uh, we're all here for you uh, to help through this uh, tough and scary time. It's been a while since we've had a downturn uh, like this. You know, typically market downturns, 20%, uh, 30% uh, happen once every little over three years on average. And this is the first one we've had since 2008, 2009. So people haven't had a chance to become terribly prepared. So first I'll cover a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, I'm planning on talking for 30 minutes, plus or minus five minutes. Um, then we'll have 15, 20 minutes for questions after that. Uh, the questions will be handled uh, uh, and funneled to me through a moderator. So um, the way uh, to get them to us is to uh, touch your chat button, type in your question, and the moderator will pick it up and uh, pass them along to me um, via uh, messaging. Um, also, uh, if we don't get to your question uh, for one reason or another, um, sometimes I've, I've tried to anticipate many in the presentation. Feel free to contact your wealth counselor again or me uh, directly. So let's uh, let's begin here. Um, what happened uh, this year with the economic shocks we've experienced with the coronavirus and the oil shocks happened not in a vacuum, but on top of uh, some pre-existing conditions. So before um, all this started, we had an environment where even though the U.S. hadn't had a recession in 11 years, the foundations in the U.S. economy were pretty solid. Consumers were spending, had very low debt servicing burdens. Um, things were slowing down a bit. Uh, in Europe, we were coming out of a slowdown or in Germany, a, a light recession. And Europe, uh, the Pacific, Northern Pacific region was also coming out of a downturn or slowdown. Um, not recessionary conditions, um, but as, as we, as you remember in the news in 2010, there was a lot of talk about uh, green shoots. And so um, that market, that backdrop was not one that would presage a, an environment like we've had today, a, a, a recession. Um, now, what we're going through here today is a, is a pretty big market downturn. Um, I came across this quote from John Stuart Mill in a piece by Michael Semblist at JP Morgan. Um, when he talks about this just before the start of the, few years before the start of the Civil War about how uh, countries that experience national disasters, um, natural disasters or uh, uh, wars, uh, it's amazing how resilient they are and how they tend to recover within a matter of years. I really like that quote and I, I wanted the uh, people to keep that in mind going forward. Um, so the current bear market um, began in February. Uh, it was crystallized by the uh, fear over the coronavirus and the um, inability of the uh, OPEC to agree on production uh, declines in oil uh, in their uh, oil markets uh, in response to Saudi's increased production and then offered price concessions, which created the price of oil. So those two things are uh, 
the reduction in economic activity from the coronavirus and the drop, massive drop in oil price were very disruptive. So selling began and much like 1987 where markets dropped very quickly, um, with, uh, and the S&P dropped 18% in a day, one day or 22% in the Dow, uh, they dropped very quickly here this year uh, for similar reasons that investors had strategies, a lot of investors in the marketplace had strategies where as volatility increased, they would reduce the amount of risky assets in their portfolios. And these are risk par investments like risk parity, pools, hedge funds, uh, commodity trading advisors, and other strategies which relied on option or volatility hedging. And they all were selling at the same time. And so that's why the market moved so quickly. Retail investors and, and large pension plans were not uh, uh, part of the selling. Later on, uh, as market prices declined, players that were leveraged uh, had to meet margin calls. And in order to meet those margin calls, they had to sell uh, investments into an, uh, a marketplace that had much uh, increasingly less volatility and uh, uh, just added to the price declines. And we saw that uh, a week ago Monday that pretty much um, uh, was a paroxysm of the of, uh, of forced selling and the way you can tell forced selling is going on is everything goes down so stocks go down treasuries go down even gold they all everything went down as people scrambled for cash to meet uh, margin calls so most of the institutional players that were hedging uh, volatility in one way or another a lot of them don't have much more to sell but we're not sure how much more unwinding will occur due to deleveraging. Um, that that's still a risk out there. So um, underpinning the market too, uh, stock buybacks have seized, which was a big underpinning of the U.S. market in the last nine or ten years. We've had three up and counting today, three up days in the last five, but the moves are very large. So big moves are up and down, you know, in excess of two, three percent a day, do not signal a healthy near-term market, whether they're up or down. So we don't know if the volatility is over yet. So that's kind of where we are and how we got there. And then uh, instead of going through all the different asset classes and how they did during the quarter, here's uh, year to date through, um, I, I believe it's last Friday, in, uh, approximately how investments have done. The red bar is a range from the um, last, uh, year to date and then the yellow is about where things were as of last friday so you can see most investments have recovered from their lows but are still down so at the top we have uh, the safest investment in this decline was u.s treasury bonds uh, gold has been a good diversifier uh, anything short-term dollar investments have worked uh, german bones but then beyond everything else beyond that has declined to varying degrees if um uh, the more credit risk and fixed income, uh, like in, uh, investment grade bonds or um, emerging market debt or high yield, the more risk, the, the higher the decline. And then the stock markets, about what you'd expect. The U.S. was down um, about, as of this date, about 25, 26 percent. Um, I'm sorry, 23 uh, percent. And the uh, European markets were uh, in, in terms of dollars, which are a little more risky because of the currency risk, we're down a little bit more and the e emerging markets are down a little bit more than that. That's about, when in down markets, they go down a little bit more and up markets, they, they're supposed to go up a little bit more. And then the big casualty was uh, oil. And so uh, this is where we stand right now. Um, in the oil markets, by the way, uh, you know, when the oil price is in the 20s, there are a few fields in the Saudi Arabia region, maybe Kuwait, that can make money. No one else makes money. Um, no one else can spend money exploring for oil. And uh, no government can make balance their budget, Saudi Arabia, Russia, or anyone else, uh, based on $20 oil. So that's not a sustainable uh, decline. So in terms of bear markets where we are, um, here's a list of the, of the bear markets since uh, 87. And bear markets are close to them. Even uh, bear markets defined as a decline of 20%, but we have some here at 19, along with um, the length, bear market length. And you can see some of these lasted a matter of months. And as a, and in the tech case of the tech bubble, 
a little over two years and the financial crisis as well. So the declines were relatively large. In the tech bubble, we came off really high valuations, which is not as much the case this time around. And in the financial crisis, it was more of a depressionary environment than a, a plain vanilla recession. So we're not looking for declines of these magnitudes in this downturn, despite the fact that it's very severe from an economic standpoint. Uh, when, the, when we have recovery, it's typically uh, quick and large. The next 12 months, the numbers can very, be very big. So it's very difficult to time these things. And uh, trying to sell, especially after initial decline, um, is very problematic. And if you can't predict uh, when the entry point is, it can, uh, the odds are you're gonna cost, uh, we're gonna cost ourselves money if we try to play that game. Uh, if you get a copy of the slides, here's some more color on, on um, down markets uh, since 1960. They average typically 11 months and are down about what we're down now, a little bit more and average 26%. And the recoveries typically um, are about 74% on average, uh, just to give you some perspective and uh, you can uh, look at that later. One of the biggest questions we've gotten from clients in meetings and then by emails is, is this the big one? Are we gonna go through 08, 09 all over again? And emphatically, no. Um, most recessions happen because the economy slows down because of rising interest rates or a shock of some kind. This particular incident uh, is due to a shock uh, uh, from not in the economy, but from the outside world, the coronavirus event, and then the oil, oil shock adds into that. Um, what was characteristic of the depression and the great financial crisis is that it, 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 it was like a, um, a patient in ICU on the operating table uh, in, in, in danger of dying where you, you can see their vital organs start to shut down. So in other words, major financial institutions were going bankrupt, shutting down, and the financial system was shutting down the trading, global trade was shutting down because people with goods wouldn't trust bank drafts from uh, uh, banks anywhere in the world because they didn't know if the bank was going to be in business the next day. And um, people who needed money, who had funded investments or business with short-term loans, couldn't roll those loans. So there was a liquidity problem, which led into a solvency problem. That's not what we have here. Um, uh, at least at this point, and we probably won't because of all the measures that have been taken uh, by the Federal Reserve. So um, uh, solvency and liquidity concerns have been addressed addressed massively and upfront, much, which much are, with much larger responses than happened in 2008. And uh, the plumbing, uh, not only the financial plumbing, but the trading markets have held up. They're not seizing up. Um, they're stressed, but they're holding up. Uh, handling the large volumes and the price declines quite nicely. And so we just don't see the environment. And uh, as the, as the uh, economic decline unfolds here, banks are just in way better shape. They have way more capital, way more liquidity. Um, they are, they're not dependent on short-term hot money for, for funding deposits anymore. They can go right to the Fed for uh, deposits if they need them now. And there are much smaller global imbalances. And if you remember before the financial crisis, um, there were huge trading uh, deficits uh, with different countries in the developed world, huge uh, imbalances of capital flows into other countries and, and then huge budget deficits. So right now, the biggest imbalances are in the US with a huge budget deficit and a huge trade deficit. The rest of the world is pretty even. Um, and in, in terms of the rest of the financial plumbing, um, risky assets are much more dispersed and less concentrated. They're held by unlevered players uh, capable of absorbing losses. They're not concentrated in a, a particular institution or bank. Uh, derivatives have been standardized and are trading on established exchanges to reduce counterparty risk at this point. Um, uh, rather than being private contracts uh, between players and you didn't know if uh, one player or another could honor their uh, commitments and could uh, start a chain reaction. Um, in Europe, insurance companies are subject to many of the same regulatory concerns. And surprisingly, consumer debt burdens and uh, debt servicing burdens are, because of interest rates are low, are at the same level they were in the 1980s. Um, 
Uh, so uh, it's, it's just not the same environment at all. And we don't see signs of the same stresses in the financial system that we did in 2008 or seven. So this is the um, uh, Federal, St. Louis Federal Reserve Stress Index, which follows uh, various financial markets, trading markets, and, and it spreads on fixed income investments. And you can see uh, all this has happened so fast. There's a big blip here on the right, and it's gone up quite a bit uh, uh, at the levels we were at in 2016 and then almost to the level we were at in the European crisis in 12, but nowhere near the level we were at in 2008. So, and this is, this, these um, signals are not uh, anywhere near what we would expect in the depressionary scenario. Now also uh, to forestall the economic downturn from developing into a situation where business stalls uh, and the economy stalls too much and does uh, start the string of insolvencies and problems that could res result into a, 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 an environment like uh, we experienced. Um, there are three stimulus acts that have been passed recently. Um, uh, the first one was a small one, 8.3 billion, and then that was followed uh, about a week and a half later uh, by a $104 billion boost um, to support assistance for families and unemployment benefits. And then the Massive CARES Act was passed on the 27th. And if you get a copy of the slides, these are live links that'll take you right to the legislation um, and so in the CARE Act, we have um, about uh, 2.3 billion on the face, and this is just phase one. Uh, they're already talking about extending or adding to all to benefits that uh, in here that might run out in a few months or weeks, um, or and the loans to businesses. They're already preparing a, a, a package that'll be at least half as large as this for the summer, and. Um, you can see the amounts are massive. Uh, the bulk goes to helping small businesses keep alive, which businesses employ people. Um, small businesses uh, employ the bulk of the people in the country. Six, at least 60% of people are employed by small businesses. So it's important to keep them floating. Um, and, and so this is a Herculean effort. If you remember, I don't know if you remember, but the, the fiscal stimulus in, in 2008 um, passed in the last few months of the Bush administration was about a third of this. So this is more than three times what happened in, in, the, uh, in 2008. And then the, uh, the rest of the money goes to households direct through direct payments, subsidies, um, and uh, uh, benefits and tax breaks. The tax breaks are relatively minor. And then also I've, I've included something that talks a little bit about the features uh, of, of the act in different details. And you can talk about this with your wealth counselor. If you see uh, something or your wealth counselor brings something to your attention that might be applicable to you. Um, in terms of what the Fed has done, the monetary interventions, they have acted with much more force, much more quickly uh, than they did in 2008. And they are providing backstopping in terms of liquidity uh, available to keep people solvent, businesses solvent and the financial plumbing uh, running. Um, and so here's a listing of some of the things they've done. And so if you add these up, and this is a, an example that's happening around the world, in terms of the US, uh, in terms of the percentage of the economy, um, the fiscal part of the formula in the green here is about 7% of the size of the economy. And then the uh, liquidity provisions by the Fed are another um, four or five percent of the size of the economy. Um, so that's 12 percent of GDP provided, boom, within a few weeks of the start of this uh, event. And so the biggest problem we have right now is funneling this money efficiently to individuals and businesses. And as you might guess, that's a little problematic because no one in the government wasn't set up for something like this. So uh, the timing and speed of the delivery of these benefits is really important. Um, but you can see the U.S. is not alone. Um, Germany has acted decisively in, uh, in Europe. Their response has been mostly the central bank providing liquidity, buying securities. The, and right now, um, talks broke down briefly last night, but there's a huge fiscal package being negotiated in Europe 
that will add to the green substantially here to alleviate the economic downturn. So the, the idea here is these are, if I use the word stimulus, it's the wrong word. It's really stabilization. It's trying to fill the hole in the economy that's created by people in businesses not working, being laid off, or having reduced activity as in the travel and entertainment businesses. But this is th these responses are, in, are massive compared to what happened in 2008, and they're happening quickly. So how, I, how might we recover? Well, uh, we might recover uh, quickly. This is, that's case A here, where we have a huge, a, a rather large decline, 10% in economic uh, activity happening in a very short period of time. That's really unprecedented since the depression, um, but a very quick uh, recovery. Uh, case B um, talks about a little bit slower recovery um, because we lose a little bit of uh, growth potential because some of the resources that are uh, um, employed in some sectors, maybe entertainment, travel, for or big examples, may not recover right away, if ever. And then case C is what they call the U-shape recovery, um, uh, uh, where you actually have lower, much lower trend growth. I think this is way too pessimistic right now because this event with the coronavirus and the oil shock are temporary finite um, occurrences of limited uh, duration. Uh, the danger here is that the effects of them co are compounded and cause a worse economic decline. Um, but as I just went over, the Federal Reserve activity and the uh, stabilization spending by, by our legislatures are seeking to uh, forestall that from happening. Um, in times, uh, what a, there's uh, the economic recovery. In times of earnings recovery for investors in stocks, um, right now what's being priced in, um, these are uh, these come from the dividend futures market uh, late last week. Um, it's implying a, a drop. Um, I'm going to talk about the middle case here because that's close, closest to where we are now a drop in earnings per share of about 35% into uh, early next year, and then we don't recover till 2028. That's an extremely pessimistic scenario. That is um, the average time to, for earnings recovery, including 2008, 2009, is like three or four years uh, in the recessions and downturns we've had post-war. Um, so this one is saying, the current market conditions right now are pricing in that it will be more than twice as long as average for a, an event of, uh, event of finite uh, duration. Uh, so I think this is, um, and I'm not alone in this, that this is a very conservative uh, outlook. Um, and uh, But that's basically what's priced in today. Um, now, just for a little perspective in terms of economic recovery, this is uh, after World War II, how long it took Germany and Japan to recover in real per capita GDP from basically being bombed into rubble in uh, after World War II. And you can see that they recovered in about 10 years, less than 10 years in the case of Germany. So um, to say that uh, our recovery here, now earnings in the economy are not necessarily the same, it's going to be out eight, nine years um, when recovery from World War II is that long. I, I, I think that's just from a little perspective to uh, say that's a little um, pessimistic. Another thing is that market recoveries often begin when the news is bad or at its worst. Now, I have a ton of these charts for different, for high yield markets, for different recessions. So I chose the one from the 1980s, double dip. And you can see the... Um, uh, course of the of the GDP is the this line. It had a double dip um, in 80, uh, 81, then late eighty one, and then in eighty two uh, during the early Reagan administration. But the recovery of the stock market began well before the uh, dip, or when the news was worst. The economic news would be worst. Unemployment would still be increasing, and there were really no positive economic signals, and the market just took off. And that's Maybe that's what's happening now. I don't know. I, I, I'm far from convinced at this point that that's true, but it, it could be. But typically, markets will recover 
uh, while the news is worst. So paying attention to the news, which is engineered to get your attention by focusing on the, you know, the most uh, horrible thing to get your attention, um, is it was counterproductive trying to time markets. At a point, um, at a point where we are right now, uh, market valuations are very low. Um, today's prices, as I as I showed in the, one of the previous slides, are implying no earnings or dividend growth for five to 15 years, depending on what country you're talking about. Uh, we have a possible generational buying opportunity in the oil sector. Um, and so um, we definitely don't want to sell into a panic. Uh, and here, is it a good time to buy or a good time to hold? Yes. Um, we are seeing market prices um, that in terms of some of these valuation metrics, I have three measures of price earnings ratios, a measure of uh, price book. In terms of price earnings, we're almost close to single digit numbers um, in, in the emerging markets and in Europe. Uh, these are prices that you, you would have seen during the last crisis and the price to book on the uh, EM is is about where, where it was during the financial crisis in, in 08, 09. So these are very expensive. So number one, we're not we're looking at a very uh, inexpensive uh, investment opportunity set. Number two, um, when you hear or see bad news about different places, uh, Europe or, or EM, if you look at these metrics, they are very much lower than the U.S. They are already pricing in very, very bad scenarios. They are, if the bad news comes true, that's what they're priced for. And I don't think the news is going to, reality is going to, really almost never turns out to be as bad as the news. So if you look at the dividend yields from these markets, they are all massively in excess of what you can earn from bond markets. Even if the dividend yields get cut in half, they still are way higher than bond market yields. And then if you look at the earnings yields, so that's a combination of what I get paid as income plus the earnings that the companies retain to invest or buy back their own stock or whatever they're doing. Uh, we have some double digit numbers compared to, in most cases, under 1% of bond market yields. So these are priced for disaster and on a relative basis compared to what you can earn on cash or bonds, very attractive right now. Um, and as Baron von Rothschild said, uh, you, you want to buy when there's blood in the streets, and we're getting close to it. And here are the uh, return expectations pre-crisis. Um, when there's a big market decline, uh, these return assumptions, which we compiled in January, uh, for the equity markets would be higher now. All of the things, lower prices mean higher returns, and the bond market returns would be lower because interest rates are down. So these differentials between equity um, and real estate and, fix, and uh, bond and cash are still very high and even higher now because bond yields have gone down and stock, expected stock market returns will have gone up. Um, with, I have a few slides on the pandemic. Just real briefly, uh, this slide charts death tolls. And it was through um, uh, the 6th, uh, Monday, and it shows in uh, the yellow here is Germany. In most cases, Europe, uh, the U.S. and other uh, countries are either stabilizing, flattening out, which is a really good sign, or if they're increasing, they're increasing at a decreasing rate. Uh, in other words, they're decelerating, which is a, which is a good sign uh, as well. But we are not near the end of this. We don't know how long this will last, if it will recur. Um, and then this is a slide from today uh, that I, I pulled down from JP Morgan. The number of countries with con, uh, cumulative confirmed case growth um, uh, is rolling over aggressively. So um, the, a number of countries where the in, daily increases are 10% or greater rolled, started to roll over um, in late March and is decreasing. So this is a sign that things are heading in a, in a good direction. Um, and so where does it all go from here? Well, there are um, a number of things we can do uh, to keep flattening the curve, uh, restrictions like we're following now uh, in terms of uh, distancing, uh, staying at home. Uh, but at some point, 
that becomes very destructive on the economy. So there might be uh, a combination of some of these other things where there's testing, quick identification and isolation of cases uh, to keep uh, people away from the general population, um, identifying people who have antibodies who've already had it, they can go back to work, or the development of vaccines, which are most optimistic, nine months away, more likely 12 or 18 months away, or therapeutics that mitigate the worst symptoms and, and reduce the death rate. Um, there's a what will happen in the U.S. is a is a combination of these events, but we really don't know yet how um, long this will last and how uh, what what tools we're going to use in the U.S. Uh, to keep the coronavirus under control until vaccines are widely distributed. Um, so the uh, summary: the pandemic will be of limited duration. Um, economic activity and earnings are still being revised downward, but there's been massive stimulus, fiscal and global, uh, that's never happened this much or this quick. Um, uh, the interventions, when this is over, we're going to have a recovery. We're going to recover some of the ec economic activity that was lost. And then you're going to have these interventions, these, uh, injections of liquidity and spending of cash that will be still be there and be sticky, uh, that will add fuel to recovery. You might even have a market melt up. Um, so the risks of a systematic systemic meltdown are small, um, and we think the markets will begin to recover late this year, early, uh, 2021. And just remember markets typically recover long before the, you know, when the news is at its worst often. Um, and, uh, when you read about doom and gloom in the media papers, ask what, at what price are we, are we expensive and there's doom and gloom or are we inexpensive? Uh, so just to spend a minute or two, how can we help? We have a number of uh, resources at Versant. We have our wealth counselors and their teams uh, that work with each one of you uh, that are available for your questions. We actually have some uh, systemic um, uh, programs we're using to work with clients to identify um, uh, emergency relief options during the pandemic, um, what uh, other issues should we consider during a recession or market correction? Um, what issues, if someone were to be lose their job or laid off, what should we go through? All these resources are available. Um, and how has Versant been actively helping clients uh, through portfolio, global portfolio div diversification, of different types of investments that behave differently in different types of environments, regular communication, personal application of the parts of the CARE Act, the CARES Act that's relevant to you and your businesses, um, tax loss harvesting, re reviewing retirement and cash flow needs, rebalancing, and just offering a steady hand and a, a port in the storm uh, during uh, difficult times. Um, so having said that, I'll, I'll, that I'll, I'll close now and thank you all for attending and taking the time uh, to be with me here today. And I hope I was able to provide some information uh, that's comforting and of value to you. And uh, we'll take some questions here now um, for another 20 minutes or so. Also, um, well, I, I think our first question uh, will be, what is our outlook on inflation? Well, that's, that's interesting. Um, and the, another question I see associated with it, where with all the intervention by the Fed, the central bankers, and then the massive budget deficit we're seeing, which is basically we're operating like we're fighting a world war, World War II, uh, perhaps even more. Um, uh, is, there, is this a house of cards? Might there be a day of reckoning? And then what is your outlook on inflation? Those are two questions that kind of have the same answer in my view. So we have... Um, uh, budget deficits that are going to be double digits this year and next year. And we were already had a budget deficit of a trillion dollars. So let me say this, first of all, the, the, wor the worst thing for a currency is to at the same time run a big trade deficit, check, and big fiscal deficits, check. Uh, so the, the pressure, there'll be pressure on the dollar uh, going forward. Um, and Based on what we're doing now in terms of spending, instead of 2030 having a, 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 budget, a budget deficit that might be around 
100, 108% of GDP on a net basis. We're looking more like it'll be um, 130. Uh, so we're looking more like Italy or uh, a country like that. So what does that mean for inflation? Well, uh, given all the commitments we have to benefit programs, Medicare, Social Security that aren't funded, uh, excuse me, <coughs> the large budget deficits, um, at some point, uh, and you're seeing it now with gold prices going up and interest rates starting to inch up, markets are being concerned about whether governments are going to print money to fulfill these promises and inflation might be a problem. Uh, I think inflation is definitely a problem and we're increasing in our client portfolios uh, during this crisis exposures to ener traditional energy and some other things that are rock bottom prices and are um, typically historically uh, hedges against unexpected inflation. So I'm very concerned about it uh, going forward. Um, in a remote work environment, how are we keeping up morale and team productivity? Well, we were either lucky or prescient, depending on how you want to look at it. But in, uh, uh, John Mason, our uh, director of technology, has done a great job in setting us up to uh, be able to work remotely. Um, and as part of our disaster recovery planning, that we had an environment where uh, People could work from home or a remote location if necessary to serve our clients and keep things going. So um, Liz Shaybaker, our CEO, has been a, a great leader in um, keeping everyone in contact. We have uh, meetings at least twice a week um, via Zoom between employees talking about what's going on with, with you, our clients, and the firm. Um, morale is high. There's a, a lot of communication, a lot of Zoom meetings. And, uh, you know, we're, um, we're not skipping a beat, uh, really. Uh, so we miss being together, but I think morale is high and productivity hasn't been hit at all. Um, so thank you for that, that question. Um, let's see. I think uh, I have another question, questions that come out of the... Uh, um, based around emerging markets. So we have another uh, um, a client event where we are uh, hosting one of the speakers from Dimensional Fund Advisors. Uh, and two of the points they're gonna talk about are gonna be um, exposure to emerging markets, um, as well as uh, the value factor, the value, uh, what, what's up with the value premium that hasn't done so well the last few years. Um, I think that's on the 18th, so, I'm sorry, the 17th, April 17th. And so you'll all be getting email communications about that. But um, on the emerging markets, uh, emerging markets are in, have had uh, some of the biggest capital withdrawals they've had since the uh, 2008 period. And that's because investors have withdrawn money, um, either out of necessity or, or fear of risk. The thing that riles the emerging markets typically, uh, most trade is done in dollars. A lot of EM debt is in US dollars. And so access to US dollars, when everyone else in the world is coming to the US because they're afraid, it's a safe haven, investing in dollars, gathering up dollars is a shortage. And so the, the Federal Reserve has opened up swap facilities at first with its main trading partners in Europe, Canada, uh, but it's also extended them to the central banks of Mexico, Brazil, and a lot of the EM countries to help mitigate that shortage of dollars, uh, which has been one of the biggest causes of EM volatility um, in the last few micro, uh, market cycles, including 2008. From a fundamental standpoint, uh, going into this, EM markets were very inexpensive, and it might surprise you, but um, uh, in terms of government debt, they are in way better shape than we are in the US. If you, if you taking China out of the equation, it's not unusual to see 30, 40, 50% of GDP in government debt. Ours is twice that here in the US and in Europe, it's even worse. The uh, consumers have much lower levels of debt. Um, uh, most corporations, if you, again, if you take China out of the equation, most 
corporations have relatively low levels of debt. Um, and so it's largely a demand uh, uh, situation. Um, and so given what they're priced at, uh, we actually think the EM are, we like them going into the crisis, we like them even more now, but they are tend to be more volatile in uh, downturns. Uh, we got another question of inflation is ever more likely over the next few years. Will we consider inflation index securities. In other words, those are treasury bonds that are indexed to uh, inflation. And the answer is 95% of our client money is taxable. Um, and so right now, if we were to invest in the inflation index bond market, um, we would be making a yield of about zero. Uh, for a while, it was even negative. And then at the end of the year, whatever inflation is, we get a little bit of a kicker that we have to pay ordinary income taxes on for whatever the CPI is. And so if you're a taxpayer um, and you've got any kind of investments, you're probably paying at a high rate. So after taxes, we have a negative yield. Um, we still have all the interest rate risk that we would have in a treasury bond. So we're at very low interest rates. If interest rates go up for unexpected inflation, uh, the, the decline from um, rates going up would partially offset the benefit from unexpected inflation. So for clients that pay taxes and given the low real ye after tax yield on the tips, we're t we, uh, and looking at the spread that we can get now in municipals at, um, and not pay tax on them versus the uh, inflation index bonds, in the fixed income portfolios, we're going to use um, munis that are fairly high quality. Um, and we're going to take care of the inflation risk in other parts of our portfolio. Like I mentioned before, we hold typically hold some gold, even some gold mining stocks. We hold uh, resources and we're adding an energy component. And that's where we're going to choose to take care of our unexpected uh, inflation uh, risk at this point. Oh, this is a, I got a fun one. Is the US dollar losing status as a reserve currency? Well, in, in, a, in a better world, the US is, is, would lose it. It's, it's, it's doing about everything you could do to uh, make a currency worth less, spending you know, high fiscal deficits. It's in, in, the, in the 11th year of an expansion, I mean, we've, we've never heard of that. That's not something typically that's happened in American history. And now with the crisis, we're doubling down, uh, tripling down on deficit spending. Instead of a trillion dollar deficit, we're gonna be looking at somewhere between three and four trillion in one year. Um, and so uh, the problem though is uh, to, to have a reserve currency, it's kind of complicated, but you, you have to be willing to, uh, a reserve currency lubricates world trade and world capital. So. And it's also a safe haven. So if you, 80% uh, of the world's trade is in dollars. So you have to be willing to supply that amount of currency around the world. You're exporting capital, which means you're also exporting jobs. So the, the empire, uh, you know, the Netherlands and the British and us had to pay a price economically to be the reserve currency. And when, if, take, for example, China. China runs a, an economy that's based on the opposite. They're exporting um, to try to drive economic growth. Um, that's the exact opposite. You need to you need to run a trade deficit to be a reserve currency to provide uh, your currency to the rest of the world to trade or borrow in. Um, and you also need, your currency has to be very freely traded and available. So um, uh, that's not the case in China. Uh, their, their currency markets are still controlled to various degrees. Um, they're not, there aren't deep and liquid derivatives markets uh, under them. Um, so you can hedge risk, uh, trade forward, or um, uh, the different types of things you need to do to provide liquidity and currency and fixed income markets. They're, so in other words, there's just nobody even close to checking all the boxes that you would need to check to challenge the U.S. as a reserve currency. The only alternative is the special drawing rights uh, from the IMF and those have never really caught traction because they don't have any of these other features I've talked about that you need to have to lubricate the world economy and be a 
safe haven and a um, investor of last resort. Uh, I'm sorry, a uh, investment of last resort. Um, I will say one important development that's happened uh, it, is that in this last round of Federal Reserve intervention, something happened that didn't happen in 2008. And, and paradoxically, the Trump administration has always kind of had America first as its mantra and is somewhat pulled back into in trade and other uh, areas of governance to focus more on the U.S. than outside. But the central bank did something it's never really done in terms of, um, to this degree, in offering uh, liquidity in terms of currency support and uh, uh, backstopping other types of investments, um, for even foreign investments. Um, it's been more of a, a global central bank this year than it was in 2008, 2009. In other words, it's growing to be more like the central bank of the world, not just the US. And depending on your point of view, that's a good or bad thing. I think it's a good thing, um, uh, you know, especially in the world when it's so interconnected and if um, uh, one part of it breaks, it could uh, cause the rest of the world a great deal of distress. Um, I'm going to answer one or two more questions here. Um, I think uh, how much has the market already priced in? I, I tried to address that, but uh, in a couple of different ways. But right now, especially abroad, the markets are pricing in a very avert, adverse set of circumstances with uh, recoveries of earnings that are um, way longer than we typically see in a recession. Um, and this is uh, not a recession that was started by high interest rates or the things that are, uh, typically start recessions. It was a, a, a shock, uh, a one-time finite shock. And if we can keep it contained to that and not let it kind of roll into something more severe, um, we, we, uh, we should be okay. And, and, and um, it would be a good buying opportunity. And I think given the magnitude and size of the government interventions, um, that there's a, more, a very good chance that that's already been factored in. So I think uh, I'll sign off at this point, and I wanted to thank you all for spending so much of your valuable time with us. Um, if you have any further questions or concerns, feel free to call your wealth counselor or um, uh, me if you, if you have something more um, focused you wanted to chat about. And uh, thank you all for being customers uh, and clients of the firm. Uh, you're what makes us tick and what makes us get up in the morning uh, to solve problems and serve, meet your, uh, meet your goals and objectives. That's what we live for. And thank you for the opportunity to allow us to do what we love. <laughs>